Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture readings are taken from Daniel 13, 1 through 9, 15 through 17, 19 through 30, and 33 through 62, and the Gospel of John 8, 1 through 11. Um, these are uh, the readings for Saturday of the third week of Lent. And I believe I'm going to focus on uh, John 8, 1 through 11, which is the woman caught in adultery. I believe, because um, I'm recording this a little bit after I read it, but I believe Daniel is the, the story of Susanna, um, which is a great story. But we're going to focus on um, John 8, 1 through 11 from the Saturday of the third week of Lent. So first, I just want to frame this as Satan loves extremes. We, we know this. Um, C.S. Lewis, I believe, said in regards to demons and Satan, they either want you to be obsessed and, and very curious um, with them, um, you know, as if they're around every corner or paranoid or, or just enticed with them, or believe that they are completely fake altogether. And so Satan would love extremes. And, and you can usually go through this in one way or another, think about the extreme one way or another in each situation. And you can see that's definitely what Satan wants. Let's look at material goods. He either wants us to worship material goods. Um, let's take alcohol, for instance. He wants us to be obsessed with it to where we become an alcoholic. Or he wants us to think it's devil water. It's the worst thing ever. If you drink it, you're going to hell. Um, and so where is always the middle ground in things? It's to see something as it truly is. Um, so as Catholics, we want to, to see a thing as it is. We want to use a thing as it is supposed to be used. Um, and this is important. So first thing we're going to go with is that, you know, really as, as we get into this, that Satan loves extremes. In regard to judgment, uh, particularly here, um, because this is really what's happening in the story of, of the woman, they're asking Jesus to make a judgment on the fact that she was caught in adultery. Now, what are you going to do? This is what Moses says to do. Uh, what are you going to do? So I think Jesus is probably caught between two different things, a very strict implement implementation of the Mosaic law, but then also just a, hey, uh, laissez-faire, nothing really matters type of thing. Uh, you know, whatever, if it feels good, do it type of thing. So again, here I think Jesus is presented with extremes. So judge everything, condemn the act alone, just look at the external, not the internal. That's kind of on one extreme. Um, Moses says, do this. She was caught in adultery. Don't ask any questions. Stone her right now on the spot. Death penalty. Bam. Gone. Right. Um, the other extreme would be judge nothing. You know, don't, don't, no, don't judge me. I won't judge you. There's no such thing as sin. Sin is relative. That, that kind of camp. Um, what, what does actually the church, and of course the church and Christ are one, but how does the church look at sin? Um, one, this is a tribunal of penance. Penance means that there's a sense of um, wanting to change, that I, I acknowledge that I have done something, I have a sorrow for this, and I want to change, the resolve to change. Um, and so we always look at, in Catholic morality, we always look at the act, what actually was done, um, the knowledge of the act. Did you know this was offensive to God? Did you know this was wrong? And did you have your full consent? And these are the questions that then uh, are, look into the situation. Um, now, a priest, and we may return back to this, but a priest has a beautiful role in the confessional because the confessional actually is, this sacrament of confession is the tribunal of penance. It is a judgment that is made. Um, the priest is acting in the person of Christ to make a judgment, but the judgment is here whether they will absolve the sin or whether they will retain the sin. The priest also has to make a judgment on whether the person confessing, the penitent, is has sorrow for sin and has the desire to change, the resolve to change. And so very much a, a person may come to um, the priest and, and may say something like, I'm not going to Mass on Sunday. The priest needs to make a judgment on that. Uh, the priest could say, well, what's your intention? And if the person says, well, I, I, I quite like my Sundays and I don't like going to Mass, and so it's my day. Um, and so the penitent may say something like, well, this is my day. And the priest will say, well, actually, technically, this is the Lord's day. 
and the priest would need to make a judgment there. You know, the, the, the penitent does not want to change and is going to willingly persist in the sin, and so the priest makes the judgment to retain the sin rather than forgive it. If the penitent says, I am going to come back to Mass, then the priest makes the judgment and would then absolve the sin. So the priest is making a judgment in this tribunal, in the confession. The priest is also a teacher, just like I explained, explaining to the penitent um, the details of, of, of how why it's important to go to Mass, for example. The priest is also like a father, a loving father, like the prodigal son coming home to this father. The father has his arms open to embrace this person back into the church. And if this person is in mortal sin, uh, be the instrument of Christ in which they will regain grace and be back in communion with Christ and his church. So the priest is judge, teacher, and father in this beautiful sacrament. And this is what Jesus shows with this woman. The woman caught in adultery is the penitent. Jesus is going to make a judgment. Um, Jesus is going to um, be a teacher. He's going to be a father. How does all that happen? Well, he asks her, is there anyone here left to judge you? She says, no. And so he says, I'm, I'm not judging you either. You know, in other words, I'm going to um, let you go with the condition that you sin no more. So go and sin no more. Teaching there, um, acting as a judge because because he's he's determining the situation and what should move forward, and then obviously acting as a teacher and a father here to reform this woman's life. Um, so there are a few things that I also want to point out, which are which are pretty cool. Um, the the combination really that he writes in the sand. Um, and I, th I think there's, you know, there's a church father, I don't know who it is, that says that maybe perhaps he's writing the sins of the people that are accusing her. Um, the commentary that, that I read was that, um, if you remember, Adam is coming from the dirt, and so dirt and sand are very similar, that Jesus writes upon our heart. And I, this is the angle I want to kind of take with this and just this reflection that, um, you are dust, and from dust, from from dust you came. Dust you shall return. Man, you are dust. And so, if I think of myself as dust or sand, um, our Lord needs to write on my heart. He needs to write His will on my heart. And many times, I am obstinate, or the winds of this world, in a sense, um, you know, uh, I, I guess cover that up. Like if I were to write in sand and then there were a windstorm, what I just wrote would be kind of swept away. And so many times uh, our Lord will write on our heart something. We will have a conviction, a uh, resolve, a desire, um, you know, a clarity in a sense. But then the winds of this world, the devil, the flesh, and the world, particularly the winds, uh, cover that writing up and we're not as sure, we're not as clear, we're not as confident. And so our Lord will write again. Now you notice in this scripture, he writes twice. And our Lord will continue to write on our heart. But it's not just about him writing on our heart. We don't just say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, um, as if we are in isolation. He is also not just write on our heart. Not only does he write in the sands of our heart and, and speak to each of us individually, caring for us individually, in this gospel, what's what's beautiful to me, a lot of things are beautiful, but one thing is that sh this woman is left alone with Jesus. This one-on-one -on -one alone with Jesus. We are alone with Jesus every time we go to confession. We will also be alone with Jesus upon our death, immediately at our judgment, our particular judgment. And so we are left alone with Jesus. Jesus cares for each individual, each individual. Eight billion people on the face of the earth, each individual he will write on our heart because he cares for us. He directs us. He loves us. He's that judge, that father, um, that teacher for us. And he does this also, also through his church. But at the same time, he also writes in stone. In other words, there are objective truths, divine revelation. So we can't just go through and say, well, Lord, the Lord put it on my heart. We have to say, well, what did he put on my heart? In other words, with his finger, and the finger of God is the Holy Spirit, so he writes on the sand with the Holy Spirit. So in other words, Jesus, our Lord, is writing upon our heart, using the Holy Spirit to write upon our heart 
but we can't just say this is what he told me we have to balance that also with what he has revealed so one way you can think of this is what is written in stand, sand or what we believe is written in sand on our heart needs to be paired up with what has been written in stone what has been written in stone well this would be his divine revelation and this would also be extended to the traditions of the church um, not just what is written down but also what has been orally spoken by the apostles the church fathers the church for two thousand years so we have this beautiful example of what is written in stone what would that be that would be the old testament things like the ten commandments that would be the words of our Lord, specifically said in scripture and the gospels but it's also what has been passed down uh, faithfully for 2,000 years through his church. So that is what's written on stone. But then we also have Jesus writing on our heart, loving us each day, um, inspiring us and directing us and guiding us. Um, so Jesus is put in, a, again, going back to the, the situation that Jesus is put into. He's put into a situation where he, has, he, he either has to take the extreme um, stone, right? Which would be uh, the Mosaic law, the strict law, or he has to take the sand only, that there's nothing concrete here, it's just kind of can be blown around by the wind, uh, come and go as you please type of thing. So the stone side would be, um, if he lets her go, you know, if he just lets her go right now, he's going to offend Moses. He's going to offend the law of Moses, and, and then the people will be upset at him. However, um, if, if he, I, I'm sorry, yeah, that's that case. If he condemns using the Mosaic law, then the Jewish people, of course, and the Pharisees will be happy. But if he, um, he will offend Caesar because he is then putting the law into his own hands. At this point, the Jewish people ha uh, no longer had uh, capital punishment. There was a point in which they could put someone to death, but they handed that right over to Caesar. They handed that right over to Rome. And so if Jesus says she should die, then he's kind of acting like Caesar. And this would, of course, offend Caesar. So he is either going to, with his decision, and this is why they ask, this is why the Pharisees ask this question. They're trying to trap him. If he says, let her go, he offends Moses and the Jewish people. If he says, condemn her, he offends Caesar and the Romans. So the civil law. What does Jesus do? Well, he, he, does, he does the perfect situation. He's going to... Um, basically hold her accountable by saying sin no more. He's going to hold her accusers accountable by saying you also are sinners. But he's also then going to tell her, he's going to let her go, but he's going to say sin no more. So again, what is he, he's, what is he doing here? He's taking the law of the church, the law of Christ and establishing a church in which, as I said before, it's going to look at all the situation. It's definitely going to look at the act and say that what she did was wrong. But it's also going to look at, did she know it? Did she consent? And all of these things. And then what is her willingness to change? And with the help of God to go and sin no more. So acknowledging the sin, also acknowledging the person with the directive, go and sin no more. Um, so again, God the Father writes on stone. This can't be abrogated. This can't be just done away with. God writes on stone. The finger of God through the Son of Man also writes on our heart. And so these laws that are written on, on, on stone need to truly be known. We need to personally know them, love them, and consent to them. Um, so there needs to be a, a softening of our heart to accept what has been written on stone. Um, and I, I think that's how these two things go together. Uh, both the the act, which is stone, the consent, the knowledge, which is the sand, that our Lord puts it on our heart that we follow these laws not out of a, a hardness or a rigidity or a fear in a sense, but out of a love that we actually say, you know what, these laws are given to me by God. Um, I know that they're good. I know that they're good and I want to do them. I want to do them out of love. You know, the act of contrition is so beautiful because it acknowledges our sins and it says, you know, that I, 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 I dread the loss of heaven. Um, and I, dread, I dread the loss of hell, heaven. I don't want to go to hell. But most of all, what is the motivator? Why do I want to turn from sin? Because it has offended thee, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. So there are three reasons why someone could be sorry for sin and, and even want to stop sin. 
And that would be because they fear the punishment, in this case, hell. Um, they want some type of reward, you know, some type of accolade, you know, in this case, it would be heaven. Um, but the most perfect reason to want to stop and to obey someone and to do the right thing is really out of love. And this woman, the woman caught in adultery, loves Jesus. She loves Jesus. She continues to love Jesus. Many people say this is Mary Magdalene. And from the moment that Jesus looked into her eyes, helped her out in this situation and said, go and sin no more. Many people teach that she did never sin. She never committed a mortal sin the rest of her life. Um, she was, of course, at the foot of the cross showing that love. And and this is what love does. It's, it's, it's the, the perfect uh, motive of wanting to be obedient to God and change our lives and follow him, no matter how hard that might be. Thank you for joining me for this Lexio on the go. Please take the time to visit linktoliturgy.com where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. Please also check out our online school, linktoliturgy.teachable.com. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.